Yep. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Kevin Gallagher, back again with another installment of the Aces Jiu-Jitsu interview series I've been running. I've been doing some podcasts and uh, blog posts and things for them. And uh, I have been having some pretty interesting people come on and talk jiu-jitsu, talk fighting, talk about pretty much anything, man, because they give me a pretty pretty, pretty long leash, which sometimes isn't too great with me because I don't know where the hell that thing leads. But today, I have someone that is way, way smarter than I'll ever be to come on and talk. Someone that uh, I have spoken to on several occasions in the past. Uh, someone that I really uh, have a great admiration for because not only are they an intelligent person, they give me insights into the thing that I love and the thing that I am more passionate about than anything else on the earth, and that is MMA and jiu-jitsu from a very psychological, scientific point of reference. Uh, so today we're going to be talking to Dr. Gino Chalura. I hope I said your name right. <laughs> Dr. Gina Kalor, Chalor, we'll get to that later. He is a PhD in neuroanthropology and uh, neuropsychology, right? Nor fix it for me, guys. I tried. I'm no, sorry. you're good, man. You're good. You're good. <laughs> like, PhD in neuroanthropology. Neuroanthropology. I even wrote it down wrong. We this is this is how crazy I am, by the way. We actually we actually practiced this moments before I pressed play. I actually I even wrote as I was saying neuroanthropology, I wrote neuropsychology. That's the horribleness of this moment. I'm sure that you could spend an hour just dissecting my oh, brain. Boy. Great, but that's man. not important. Let's talk about jujitsu, man. So thank you very much for coming on the show today, man. No, man, always a pleasure talking to you, man. You know, I, as as much as you know, you, you say that I bring to you, you you bring equal amount, if not more, to me, man. So it's always a pleasure. I really appreciate that, man. You're you're a smart cat. We've had some good conversations in the past. Absolutely, man. So let's jump right into it, man. So. You have done several studies in the field, obviously in the field of, of, of your field, but I, you've done a few things that are specific towards uh, jiu-jitsu in the study of the psychology of jiu-jitsu. In particular, you worked with some veterans. You did some studies on PTSD that we'll get to in, in a bit. We'll start to tie that in just because I love to talk about veterans. Anything that helps veterans out, anything that I can do to help out people yeah. through what I love, I'm always big on trying to push and promote that with whatever spirit of influence that I can I can put together. But in particular, let's wrap a little bit about the psychological aspects of jiu-jitsu that maybe make it better or different from other martial arts. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> dude, there's a lot here, right? <laughs> there's a lot here and it's so interesting. I actually had a discussion this morning with two ladies uh, who are writing a book right now talking about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu as therapy uh, for folks who have experienced any kind of trauma. So not just the military, but anyone going through trauma. But, you know, I, I think a good place for us to start is the nature of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, right? It's a, a beautiful culmination of, of strategy, physical prowess, timing, tactics. But one of the biggest things that really, I think, separates it from other arts that are out there is the amount of time that is spent in extreme close proximity and in sometimes some, some really awkward positions, right? But you learn to become comfortable with those awkward positions, right? And so, you know, and Kevin, you know it's better than I do, that the, the, the rule of thumb of connected is protected, right? So when you're rolling with somebody, right, or whatever that looks like, as long as I have points of contact, right, we're good. If you were to think about the striking arts, you're always kind of rolling the dice, man. There's always that lucky shot, right? That guy could always have that one lucky shot that knocks me out. Jiu-Jitsu, it's a little bit different story, right? Because I am tight. I can feel your body moving. I can feel you shifting, which is a little bit different, right, than having that space that's associated with other types of martial arts. I mean, man, even something, you know, to, like uh, Muay Thai, for example, tremendous respect, incredible martial art. Um, but the intimacy factor, and even and you can, folks could make the argument, you know, when you're in a clinch, right? Well, you're still close then, but man, it's, it's very different, right? W once you are on the ground, you're chest to chest. So I've got vital organs to vital organs neck to neck, right? Whatever the case is, but you are crossing barriers of intimacy and personal space that you typically do not see in other martial arts. So, 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 so based upon that, when we start to talk about how that is therapeutic for people that have experienced uh, some kind of traumatic episode, explain to us how that correlates in the healing process. Yeah, man. So that's a great one, right? So, so trust, 
right? Where does trust start? Well, if I've been highly traumatized by something that has happened in my life, somewhere something's not lining up and I don't see things quite the exact same way other people do because of my lived experience. Well, when you start peeling the layers back of what it takes to, to foster trust at the most primal of levels, I mean, Kevin, when, when you roll right with someone who, who is a black belt that you know, are you nervous? No. No. Maybe sometimes, no. but but yeah. I but I, I can I can follow your train of thought, right? Right. Where where you have someone who's been training for two weeks, right? right. And, and they're 300 pounds and they're coming in just uh, I get more nervous, right? right? Rolling with that guy than the guy who is seasoned, right? Because it's a trust factor. I, I don't know what the control uh, gauges are on that particular person and understanding what it is that they're doing and how they're using their body. So when you right. take a look at folks who have gone through trauma and have a hard time trusting other people, jujitsu forces you to trust your training partners. Because if not, you can't train, right? I mean, I'm literally, there, there's times where you're, you're working an arm bar or a triangle or a rear naked choke, and I'm giving those things to you so you can get the reps in, right? And so that at, at any given time, if I was in the street, would I voluntarily put my arm out there for an armbar? Absolutely not. But that's training. Right? That, that's why we do what we do. So in that sense, it, it pushes you to really foster a deeper sense of trusting another person where it's not just your emotions that are on the line. It's your your physical prowess and even your psychological well-being that is on the line. Yeah, I I, 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 it's, these are thinking. These are all things that, like in my mindset, I it's it's I understand these concepts from a practical point of view because I've seen them in action. And I've seen things like this happen through people that experience trauma, and I understand in a roundabout way how they are healing from point A to point P. But to hear someone like yourself give the the actual scientific breakdown for it, not only does it make me understand what's happening, but it gives me a better understanding of the why and therefore a better appreciation of how amazing and how beautiful jujitsu is and why I feel like everyone should be doing it. And it's, it's great, man. So keeping that in, in mind and moving right along, let's talk a little bit about jujitsu as a martial art in general and, and some of the things that occur during the martial art process. Because again, I, understand and respect jiu-jitsu as the greatest martial art for self-defense for one primary reason and that is the idea that the techniques of jiu-jitsu might not be superior to krav maga or to some of the other striking arts you know some of the other weaponized arts we use weapons and things like because obviously you know particularly start talking about dealing with multiple attackers all these things right. like that but it's the idea of practicing jiu-jitsu at the pinnacle, the highest levels of of recreating what a real life scenario will be like, fighting for life or death, to recreate those scenarios. So thereupon, the techniques are one thing, but you, what you're really learning and training the brain to do is to function under those stressors and under that period of duress to be able to think and stay cognitive. Talk to me a little bit about that from a scientific point of view. So that's a really big deal, right? So when we start thinking about, there's a concept that we use quite a bit in the human behavior field, which is called mental models, right? And so what is a mental model? Well, if you think about how it is you go about doing your daily life on a regular basis, right? We all get into patterns. We get into routines. We get into habits, right? That is what defines our normal, right? What do we consider as normal? Well, anything that's new may not seem normal at first, but after six months to a year of me doing it, it's going to become normal, right? And so that is just a normal assimilation and acculturation and normalization process. When you take a look at what it takes to condition someone for a self-defense altercation, and if what they're training is, all right, you're going to train up to this particular point right here, then stop. Because if you go past this, you're going to get hurt or the other person is going to get hurt, which you see in a lot more of the quote unquote lethal arts that, that exist out there that are, are weapon based. You can only go so far right? Because whether you're using a knife, a stick, a gun, doesn't matter. You're still in a training environment. Jiu-Jitsu, you maintain the idea that you are in a training environment, but you can go 100%. You can sit and you can ratchet up so you know what it's like when you're breathing out of every orifice that you've got, when you're absolutely exhausted and someone's cranking on your neck, someone's cranking on your arm. And then you have to ask yourself, so how am I going to respond right now? I I'm in it. What do I do? It's very different when I'm training in a a weaponized type martial martial art, and 
we're going, but we're going at about 70%, 65%, and we have a ton of safety gear on. It, it's a very different feel where jujitsu, you're chest to chest, man. Whether it's gi or no gi, it doesn't matter, right? You, you're mimicking what it would look like to have an, uh, an unarmed confrontation, hand-to-hand -hand combat, and, and what that is going to feel like emotionally and psychologically. Now, the, the part where it does get a little bit different is everything that's leading up to the point of confrontation, right? So all the stuff about getting worked up emotionally, all the stuff about getting worked up psychologically. And Kevin, you know this, man, like, you know, when you are rolling, especially at a very high level, it, it is much more about being able to see five, six, seven, eight steps ahead, right? Than it is than being directly in that moment. So when you can adopt that mentality, and that becomes your go-to, that becomes your new mental model, as opposed to, I just have to respond to this one quick thing really quick. Dude, it's a game changer, because now I, I know I can feel where your body's gonna go, and I've done this position enough times to know what the different options are, because I've dealt with different body types, different approaches, and so it instills a level of confidence that is very hard to replicate and mimic. I mean, I'll tell you, in, in the studies that I did with the military, you know, when you are training, uh, when military members are training to go and execute a mission, especially tier one, tier two assets, like your, your Delta Force, like th those sorts of guys, they rehearse, right? They, they will sit, they'll do a mock-up of wherever they're going, and especially if it's a high value target, and they will try to utilize intelligence to rehearse over and over and over again, what's going to transpire? If this goes wrong, what's the contingency? So on and so forth. Well, jujitsu gives you that opportunity. It gives you the opportunity to rehearse. Right. But, but it's a different type of a rehearsal because what are we rehearsing? Combat. Right. We're, we're engaged. I, I don't know a you know, guy on the street. I don't know what his background is. You know, size him up, whatever. But still, you don't you, until you're in it, you, you don't know. So um, th that is a very unique and special thing about jujitsu is that it does allow you to go 100 percent, not worried about the not worry about the injuries, but at the same time, cultivate and solidify bonds with with folks that you're training with. But from a self-defense perspective is priceless and I, you and i've talked about this before of, of the martial arts that i've trained nothing has given me the confidence and the character refinement attributes quite like jujitsu it, it, it's inherently unique and special on that sense because i get to put a reset button you got me you tap me great let's reset let's start again right if i'm sparring someone in boxing and he clips me and i break my nose i'm more than likely done sparring for the day right and so with jujitsu you get the armbar you get the choke I got it. I see it. I feel it. Tap. Let's start again. Let's let's stop. Now, you, you said a big a big uh, phrase there that I that I that I that I kind of understand. I understand the process of it. For the folks at home, let's talk a little bit about character refinement because I think that's another very unsung. I mean, and you're going to get that in lots of martial arts. I think one of the greatest things of martial arts is the fact that it builds character, it builds goal attainment, all the other things that come from 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 striving to, to get better. But there's a certain special part of jiu-jitsu that builds that character refinement because you are getting the shit kicked out of you for a long, long time. And there's nothing more humbling than that. I've And again, I, I always use this analogy. I've seen it make... It makes the meek strong and it makes the strong humble across the board. It finds what you need and it gives it to you. That's Tell right. me a little bit about that character refinement, what you feel about that. <sighs> so it's amazing, man. Like, you know, you, you when you look at so how, how many slices of humble pie can someone eat, right? <laughs> how many times can you get that pie shoved down your throat to where you get to a point to where it becomes your new normal, right? Being humble, knowing that there's always someone better, knowing that there's always someone quicker, faster, more technical, whatever the case is. Jiu-Jitsu, because not, not just from a rolling perspective, but also from a drilling and a fitness perspective, when you are constantly surrounding yourself with people, and some of the best instructors I have ever met and ever had the privilege to train with, they're, they're the most humble people. And I mean, world-class athletes, but they're incredibly humble because they have captured that idea of there is always someone better. And it's not a theory. It's proven because that guy tapped me seven times last year right and this is the guy who's tapping me 20 times and it's like what planet are you people from right you know so but when you, when you go farther down that path and down that road the idea of being able to be okay and confident with knowing your true capabilities and abilities is a big deal because so many of us 
what we think we can do in our mind, right? And I'm not negating like, you know, being a visionary and being creative, but legitimately as, as human beings, our combative prowess, when you learn real quick that you're not Superman, dude, <laughs> like you, I know you think you are, and I know you're really badass, but here's the reality of the situation. And you put it all on the line, you're using all your strength and your speed, and it's getting you nowhere but gas. You don't have a choice because you just ran into a cement wall. So now you, you have to do a gut check and either you're going to garner the intestinal fortitude to continue to eat those pie, those pieces of humble pie, or you're just not going to come back to class. And that is one thing about jujitsu culture. It weeds out folks pretty well about who's who's got the right stuff to build off of to really begin that character refinement process. Because I think the entire goal for anyone who trains and trains for the right reasons, you know, of course, the self-defense aspect is really important, but it's much more about just becoming a better human being. Yeah. And, you know, to, to tie it back into the self-defense aspects and the confidence you find in a street fight. And I say confidence in this regard because confidence in just when you talk about overconfidence, you talk about lack of humility in the street. Like nothing will, will make you recognize the fact of the, the, the realization of your own mortality like getting your ass kicked by a 130 pound skinny nerd that, <laughs> that that's, you know, a purple belt or brown belt that ties yeah. you up in knots and, and holds a 220 pound man on the ground and you can't move yeah. and you can't figure out why. Yeah. So now when you go out into the real world and there's a real life circumstance of a conflict, so many people have this false sense of, of security this false right. sense of tough guyness. Well, now when I'm out and then again, when you talk about self-defense, I always tell this to everyone, the best way and probably the only way to really win a fight is to not get in one. That's so when you're in a situation where you need to be prepared, you're not overconfident to think that I can take on anyone in the world. I'm Mr. Billy Badass because you don't know who that guy is. You don't know where he's been. You don't know what he's all about. Like I, I consider myself a pretty tough guy, and I work in dive bars and done all kind of shit. And yeah. like when I'm in every, every any conflict I'm ever in, I'm always – unhappy about going into it because you don't know anything about that. You don't know. And I think that's a really big thing you just said, man, you know, the unknown, our brains, <clears throat> our brains don't like ambiguity. It does not, it, it doesn't like not knowing what's next, right? That's why we establish routines and patterns because it's predictable. Our brains find comfort and be able to predict what's coming. So when we're in a legitimate mortal altercation with somebody else, and yes, I, I may carry that sentiment of, man, I train three or four times a week and with some savages. So I'm pretty sure I'm going to steamroll right through you. Right. As compared to saying, yes, I know I train. But at the same time, I really don't want to do this with this person. I'd much rather walk the opposite direction, avoid the conflict in the first place, because you just no one knows what the outcome is going to be. Right. And so to be able to maintain that humility is such an important thing, man, um, that, you know, I, I do think is very unique. Um, within jujitsu culture, I, I have a tendency of, of, of finding more folks who really appreciate the and, and every martial art ha has this. So I'm not going to negate that at all. But you're served that humble pie every single time you roll. Right. Or, or you should be in most academies. You know, as much as you are tapping people, you are getting tapped as well. That's the whole point of challenging and pushing yourself with who it is that you choose to train with. And that part of it, man, it never it's never ending. It never, ever stops. Um, you know, I think about my coach, you know, Roddy Ferguson, he, he tells me about his, role. I love Roddy. oh yeah, man. He tells me about good friend. Laborio. And he's like, that guy just, he, he, he makes child's play with me. And I'm thinking to myself, like Roddy and I will be rolling and he's like, all right, I'm going to sweep you. You're going to go over here. I'm like, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm going over there. <laughs> it's, it's not even a question, man. So, um, yeah, it just keeps things in perspective. Yeah, and the idea that there is someone out there that can dominate uh, Roddy in the way that he dominates you. It's there's so many levels. I I say that all the time. Like I I will murder most of my students and, and treat you know not play with them like 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 a kitten with a string, and then I'll go around roll with Matt Arroyo, and he'll do the right. same thing to me. You know, right. it's just it's yeah. that, and I'm, there are people out there that will do the same thing to Matt Arroyo on on a, on a, on a on a similar level, you know, there's right. just levels to everything, and it's very yeah. it's, you never get past that. You don't, man, and that that that, that I really think is is a big distinguishing factor. Is that you know you've got guys, man, in their 60s, 70s who are savages. They're rolling, I mean, they're, they're crushing it, man. Just like you have 
17, 18 year old young ladies who, who are a buck 10, buck 15. Right. And they're gumby, man. Like they're right. slapping all kinds of techniques and, and being able to hold guys my size down. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's jujitsu is, is, is beautiful in that regard that it just gives everybody a fighting chance. And it, 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 it right. Yes. The beauty of the technique gets it there. A hundred percent. Let's talk a little bit about a few. Let's get back to the psychological processes. We talked a little bit about um, how training jujitsu, like the techniques are great, but it's really about training the mind to stay focused under duress. Right. Let's talk a little bit about the physiological processes that occur during a situation of survival, a.k.a. fight or flight is the terminology that everybody likes to use. But discuss a little bit about that process and why jiu-jitsu helps to train to, to beat that. Yeah, so, so it's, it's interesting, right? I mean, when you take a look at what happens in, in the paradigm of fight, flight, or freeze, right? Th th those three options. <clears throat> Most folks, outside of what they see in the movies, right, and what they think of in their, in their figurative imagination – they legitimately, as, as, as folks in the West, right here in the United States, legitimately being in a life or death situation is not a daily occurrence for us. Hell, it's not even a, a monthly occurrence for us, maybe not even a yearly occurrence, right? So when you are <clears throat> pushing yourself to A, overcome a lot of the internal psychological fears that you have, ego, pride, uh, being able to have an honest dialogue with yourself and your true capabilities and capacities, that sense of confidence starts to tap into how it is that you respond with fight, flight, or freeze. And so what do I mean by that? Well, if you take a look at what the norhormonal dump that happens, right? You've got epinephrine, norepinephrine, cortisol. You've got all kinds of adrenaline, stuff that's just going nuts when you're getting into that state. And if you're not used to dealing with the uptick in respiration, the uptick in heart rate, uh, the idea of, of you feel like your your chest is in your throat and how do I respond to this? If that's all new to you and you're testing it the moment that the conflict or the threat is right in front of you, that's probably going to be an issue for you, right? Where jujitsu, it, it's a gradual progression, right? So you may start your first six months and of course you're nervous, man. You're showing up to a new academy, new people, and you're doing stuff you've never done before. But that process of putting yourself in those uncomfortable circumstances to where now you're rolling and now your heart rate's increasing and now you're thinking to yourself, I'm legitimately panicked because this guy has me in a choke and I don't know how to get out, right? You are, are slowly but surely creating a blueprint with how to respond in that fight or flight sequence. And so it, it's, it's micro doses though, right? It's not the full blown shebang because you still know subconsciously you're in a training environment. But still, there gets to a point when you're that exhausted or you're that afraid, right? You can't get out. I mean, especially trauma victims, they will go into full-blown fight or flight. I mean, that, that's a very real thing. So uh, it's not very common, but it does happen. So the thing about jujitsu is that it allows you to microdose trauma response, right? If I'm going through the trauma of getting into a legitimate street fight, which absolutely, for all intents and purposes, even for the most seasoned of guys, it's a traumatic thing. I right? mean, you, you, you're, you're in battle. Right. So um, even though you may be conditioned for it, I have never met someone and I've had the privilege, man, I've talked to some seriously tough dudes like guys. <laughs> I, I mean, wow. Yeah. And they're like, man, I, we get scared before any altercation like that. That's just fear is a natural thing. That's what you do with it. There's yeah. nothing. Uh, there's nothing. MMA, jujitsu competition. There's nothing that is the same level of an actual confrontation where your, your life is on the line. There's nothing yeah. in the world because every time you have a fight. There's a fear of you dying because we're not talking about tapping. We're not talking about a referee stepping in. We're talking about some dude continuing to bang your head in the uh, ground after you're unconscious or stabbing you or killing your family. So it's it's nothing recreates that the same. Way. Well, and that's exactly right, man. And so you know when you look at because jujitsu does allow you to go 100, percent you get to put it all out there and see. So how am I going to respond, and where do I need to do better? And and, and that really is from a, a psychological conditioning perspective. When you take a look at being able to know, I mean, like breathing, for example. I mean, I'm sure if I Okay, when you first started jiu-jitsu your first year, how you would breathe when you rolled compared to how you breathe now when you roll, it's got to be night and day, right? I'm assuming it's night and day because you've learned how to pace things. You know how to control yourself because there's an additional level of confidence knowing what your capabilities are and how to maintain that short-term stint in a fight or if you're going the distance, what is that going to take, right? And so um, something that simple goes a very long way, a very, very long way. Yeah, I... 
I, I, again, I have been in many, many circumstances like this and maybe not, I don't, I always say many, many, I've been in quite a few where yeah. working in clubs where I had to, you know, take someone out or put someone down on the ground and, and control a situation or, or whatever altercations occur. And, um, I'll say this because I would, my, my next question to you was going to be asking, like, I'm, I have somewhat of a knowledge of the physiological processes, the actual physical process that happens in the brain that switches the brain from the cortex into the limbic system in, in those actual fight or flight scenarios. And my question to you is going to be, does, does training help to keep you from making that switch or does it help you to deal with understanding what the receptors are involved? So first of all, explain to the folks at home some of the differences between the cortex and the limbic system. And then let us know what your thoughts are on whether or not you're training yourself to not allow that to happen, to not let the adrenaline drop and all the other fine motor skills to go out the window. Or are you just learning to deal with that? Yeah, man. So, you know, when you take a look at the brain, right? So we all have this area called the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is like the CEO of your brain, right? It is the powerhouse for decision making, right? And that's really what we're talking about right now. We're talking about, I am making a decision. I am making a choice to either fight or to flight, or I am freezing, right? And so at that moment, the thing about jujitsu is, you know, when you take a look at the concept of neuroplasticity, Right. Well, and, and, you know, it's a catchy thing. You hear a lot of people throw that, 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 that term these days. But really, what does that mean? So neuroplasticity is this idea that there's different segments of my brain, different neurons. Right. That that you know, there's a saying that says, you know, neurons that fire together, wire together. Right. And so when I am constantly having certain neurons fire. Right. And when I'm training and I'm thinking to myself, OK, position before submission, control your breathing, all these different things that have to do with a combative mindset. I'm making decisions, which means I'm enacting that prefrontal cortex, right? And so at the moment where I look at, okay, am I going to go into full-blown flight or flight, or, or am I going to sit here and I'm going to try to slowly but surely mitigate that from happening? Let me stay grounded. Let me stay aware of what's happening. Those are all decisions. The only way you get to a point of confidently being able to make those decisions is by having conditioned and trained yourself for that, right? So what does that mean and what does that take? Well, if I'm rolling and or if I'm training three or four times a week and I'm training with people who in my mind I perceive are much more skilled than I are, much more savage than I, and in time I start to be able to hold my own, that level of confidence and discernment when I'm dealing with someone who is drunk out and about and they're just acting a fool, it equips you with a confidence and an understanding of, okay, Though this person's talking trash, now is not the time for fight or flight. Now is the time for let me walk away, let me verbally de-escalate, that sort of thing. Now, fast forward, you're dealing with someone who is much bigger, much stronger, is up in your face, and, and they're not listening to commands of you telling them to back off. Well, yeah, man, you, you may absolutely deal with that fight or flight. The difference is that you have hardwiring because of neuroplasticity that's going to be engaged the moment you make that switch because those hormones that are being released they have been microdosed in your training, right? And so it's a, it's a familiar, it's like a buffer and it's familiar. Now, once it's all in, to your point earlier, nothing can mimic a full-blown street altercation where it's life or death, right? It, it just can't, but you can get doses of it, right? And that's what jujitsu allows us to do. And then you've wired your brain as a different, there's a, and, and I'm not sure if, I've talked to some people that, again, that are smarter than I am, but the, the idea of muscle memory, how you're wiring your body to work almost independently of your mind, which is where the techniques start to come in. So you're understanding how, cause you're, you're absolutely right. Like I, I've been in some pretty serious scenarios and during the course of an actual altercation, like, and I am a very trained person, yeah. like you lose that sense of wherewithal. Like yeah. I have been in fights in, in bars where I've actually had to subdue someone on the ground and looked up and not, and still been aware and my vision still works. But because you're so caught up in the moment, I don't know who's a friend, who's helping, who's not. And like, oh, y'all better get out of my way because I'm going to get up to start protecting myself and not be able to make that rationale. And it takes a second to switch switch back into that again. You know, and what's really interesting about that too, Kev, is that, you know, there, there is this, this concept that we use called tachypsychia, right? Tachypsychia is when you go through a highly traumatic event. When you go through a highly traumatic event – and this is why you tell folks, especially in the you know concealed carry firearm community, their training, 
their instructors will tell them, listen, if you get into an altercation and God forbid you have to use lethal force, make sure you ask for an attorney, let them know that you acted in self-defense, but don't tell your side of the story. Give it a couple of days because that memory loss and that moment in time when it, everything has just hit the fan, there's subtle details you just don't have clarity on because your body has been inundated with a level of hormone that is super rare, right? Because if you've never trained to operate at that level, that's all seems very new and very foreign. I mean, you know, there, there's instances where you see law enforcement officers who have gotten into shootings and they're like, no, I only fired my weapon four or five times. In actuality, they fired their weapon 17, 18 times, right? And, and so, but the memory factor goes out the door. And so even in that moment in time, when you get up and you're looking around, it's like tunnel vision, man. Like, like you're there, but you're not, and you're not fully in tune because you're just looking for where the next threat is coming from. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I, I can relate to you on that level on 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 quite a few things, and 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 I I understand it's it's always interesting and it's always fun for me to have a conversation with someone like yourself because these are things that I know intuitively, of course, from from training as long as I have. But to have someone like yourself that has dedicated their lives to not just jujitsu, but the understanding of what the processes really are and how the brain really functions. When I hear someone you ex someone like yourself explain it to me, it makes my understanding richer so that now I have a better idea of how to, uh, how to, how to teach that. Right on. So, so let's talk a little bit about the comparisons between, uh, I know that you have, you've dealt with a lot of military guys. You've done quite a bit with military. We're and again, we're going to get back into that study because it's an interesting study. And I really want to shed some light on that, but talk to me a little bit about some of your interactions with special forces type guys, next level guys, serious operator type guys, and some of the similar similarities psychologically they may have to jujitsu practitioners and in, 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 in that regard. Man, so this is a great one, right? So it's interesting, you know, when you look at the special operations community in general, and there's many different segments to it, right? I mean, you've got tier one through three assets. You've got different folks that have different missions, right? I mean, you know, whether it's direct action, reconnaissance, whatever it is. The thing that is similar that, that I have seen in every special operations community um, that exists is for the guys who are, who are a little seasoned, who have been around the block a few times, the humility factor. It's very similar to what you would expect of a high-level jujitsu practitioner. They're very quiet. They're very meek. They're very chill. And I have never seen one of them kind of fly off the handle. Now, I've seen younger guys, right, who are new to the special operations community still have a bit of a hothead. But the older cats who have done dozens of missions, who have done or deployments, excuse me, and have been outside of the wire, so to speak, and, and done some real stuff, just like training at a very high level, when, when you're talking with folks that you know don't operate at that same level, there's no need for you to be boastful. There's no need for you to push that in their face. Um, you, know, you don't have to roar to be a lion, right? That That is a, something that is understood in that community. So, and look, man, I mean, they're workers, man. I mean, the, the, those guys put the work in. I mean, talk about training discipline. And when you look at, for most folks who dedicate you know their lives to jujitsu, you know, going into it, dude, you're not getting a black belt in three years. But it's just that's just not this is not how unless you're BJ Penn or something. Right. I don't know. Right. But most people, it's what, eight, 12, 15 years. Right. To, to get to that level. So, you know, you're walking into it with the right intention of I'm here to learn. I'm here to grow. It's not about the belt. Right. The belt's important to me. But at the end of the day, it, this is much bigger than just the belt itself. Those guys. You know, when you take a look at why they do what they do, why would you dedicate and devote your life to being the tip of the spear in military operations and military forces? Well, it's because you know you're part of something bigger. And yeah, there is something to be said about the accolades of being the best of the best, right? That will feed the human ego. No two ways about it. But when you know that you are doing something that's grounded and you are legitimately changing lives, just like every good instructor I've ever come across in Judo Jiu Jitsu, when they are in it for the right reasons, and they're passionate. Man, it's like you can't articulate what, what that interaction is like because they genuinely have your best interest at heart and, and they'll do whatever it takes to get you to that pinnacle of success and optimization as an athlete. So you see that 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 kind of same similar sentiment in the special operations community. So you talked a little bit about the humility and the uh, the humbleness that comes from attaining that level and like 
it's part of it's because when you've attained so much, you don't really care. You get to a point where you don't really care what like right. I don't you, I don't judge me. Don't judge me. I don't really care. But talk to me a little bit about like the differences between like the younger guys and the older guys and, and, and the idea of understanding what the finality of true violence really means and how maybe civilians that think they know don't really understand. Man, so th this is a big one. So when you think about mental framing of violence, right? Most folks here in the United States, when we think about being violent, the majority of folks have never been legitimately violent in their life, right? And they've never been exposed to extreme levels of, of violence. They think they know because the imagination is a hell of a thing, right? What I see in a movie, I can actually do. What I hear in a lyric, uh, in a song, it, it's it's feeding, you know, what my persona is and what my role is in any particular time and space. So when you take a look at folks who, who think that they're capable of something, and let's talk about younger folks first. If we know that they're green, right? I mean, if they don't have experience actually being on the block, right? Going outside the wire, doing their thing, being operational. Everything that they're anticipating is a direct result of their training environment that they've been in and everything that led them to that training environment in the first place. But they still haven't been tested. That metal hasn't been, been put in the forge of fire to see what it's actually made of. And, you know, there's something actually in my study that I make mention of. Um, there's a gentleman by, by the name of Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman, who's a clinical psychologist in the Army, has a phenomenal book called On Killing. I would highly recommend any, anyone to read it. Um, but essentially saying that when you go back to Vietnam, only 30 percent of soldiers who were actively involved in firefights actually shot back and aimed at the enemy. It means you had 70 percent of folks who had a rifle who were getting shot at and they made the choice not to shoot back. Right. They've been trained. They have put through all the protocols of the military. But when you're taking a look at what you think it's going to be like compared to what it's actually like, night and day, right? So when you take a look at young folks who, who go into the military, they go into special operations, they do a very short stint because maybe it's not what they thought it was going to be, and then they get out, you typically ha have, have uh, a challenge being able to bridge certain gaps that, that you wouldn't see with someone who's been in that community for 15, 20 years, right? Because they know that it's a process, right? So I can go and I can have the maturity to pass any sort of qualification course for, for special operations teams. But then once I am operable and actually out there running and gunning, and then I come back to the States and I'm like, wow, yeah, you people have no idea what war is actually like. You have no idea what, what it's like to, to see kids and, and women blowing up, like all that kind of stuff, right? It's heavy, it's mundane, it's nasty. Um, and, and very few folks are, are willing and able to, to lock in and, and stick with it. So when you take a look at the older guard, man, they've seen it all. I and mean, especially now, I mean, Kevin, I'll tell you, man, our military force right now, you've got guys who have been at war for 15, 20 years. I mean, just... Uh Constantly. Holy smokes, man. It's a very small, right? Less than 1% of the entire population of the U.S. But still, like, you, you, man, like th that's that's something, historically speaking, we haven't necessarily seen for that amount of time here in this country. So so that's a good, uh, that's a good segue into several of the reasons why I've interviewed before your case study and the effects of PTSD on soldiers and how they deal with the effects of war over the long haul. And, um, you know, I, 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 I familiar with your study. I know your study pretty well. I've interviewed you several times on your study on dealing with PTSD and the effects of war and how training jujitsu helps to heal those wounds. But tell us a little bit about that approach and that study you've gone through. Yeah, man. So, you know, a, a big thing. So if you go back to kind of earlier in our discussion, talking about the closeness, the proximity, right, that, that jujitsu calls for. And not to mention, when you look at the ethos of what jujitsu was founded off of in the first place, you're talking about the samurai spirit, right? The approach to, to war, right? That is not just something that is physical in nature, but there is a mental and a spiritual component that comes along with it as well. Whether folks talk about it or not, when you take a look at the roots, that that is there, right? And so, um, you know, when you when you are able to understand that being a combatant, being a warrior right, it, it is not just something that you do for fun. It's a calling. Right. And so being able to indoctrinate yourself to where you're in the military, you go to combat, you come back and you're having issues with assimilating and adjusting back into society. It's because people that you were used to spending your time with 
they're not there anymore. Whether it's through loss in combat or disjunctures because they live across the country, they're still deployed, whatever it is. That sense of belonging, human beings, we are collective by nature, man. We're social beings, right? There's a reason right, why, why, you know, prisons, they put guys in isolation, right? And it's horrific, right? When you go weeks upon weeks by yourself, you literally will go nuts. And so when I choose to isolate myself because I feel people can't relate to my life and my story and my trauma, it's incredibly, incredibly dangerous to do as far as from a mental health perspective. So what does jujitsu allow? So jujitsu allows a place that is rooted in combat. It's a different type of combat though, right? But we're still talking about this versus that, right? And whether it's techniques, people, doesn't matter. There's still a comparison and there's still adversity that has to be overcome. And it's overcome as a tribe, right? That, that's one thing that I think is really unique about jujitsu as well. You know, you've got some schools who are very open to cross training and open their doors to other schools. And we can, you know, kind of learn from one another and do that. And then you have other schools who are like, no, I mean, our way is our way. You guys do your thing and we'll meet at competitions, right? And so, um, you know, when you take a look at what it means to have that kind of diversity, but more importantly, that type of belonging, knowing that I belong to this crew, I, I, I rep this crew, right? It's very similar to me saying, you know, I, I'm a Marine or I'm a soldier, whatever it is in a specific division, specific unit, so on and so forth. So there is inherent value to that. And there's a concept that we use called social capital. Social capital just means what the bank of relationships are that you have, right? That, that provide meaning and value to your identity, right? And so when I am surrounding myself, and even though they're not veterans, I still sweat with them. I bleed with them. I talk with them, right? They sacrifice their limbs for me, just like I sacrifice more for them. That sort of camaraderie, you don't find in corporate America, right? You don't find in other job settings. Heck, you, it's very hard to kind of find that sometimes in other martial arts, right? So, some get close, I think, but but not a, a, as pungent as jujitsu does. Um, because the nature of how close we are, right, and, and how much I have to trust you. I mean, look, the idea of, of you go up to and you hug somebody, why are hugs so significant? Because we're literally, we're chest to chest, we're neck to neck, right? And so that may seem kind of left field. But when you think about what you're doing, I mean, Kevin, you being a trained guy, if would you ever just go to a stranger that you thought would be a potential threat and go and hug them, expose yourself that way? No, no not at all. Right. right, right. That's the last thing you want to do. But now I'm voluntarily doing that with people I don't really know. So it's starting to it, it breaks barriers, right? That people put up um, that prevent them from being able to, to, to feel trust, to be able to feel positive and constructive relationships with other folks. So that's that's cool let's let's talk a little bit about what the scars of ptsd are in specific and yeah. how jujitsu helps to 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 reassimilate uh soldiers suffering from them scars to to get back into real life yeah yeah man so <clears throat> you know one of the most powerful things man that i have found in jujitsu is, is the tap Right. Well, right. Well, why, why the tap? Right. So if you think about what most folks in the military, the level of loss and trauma that they feel and look in PTSD is not just about actions that a soldier or, or a military member engaged upon. It's also what they witnessed as far as loss is concerned with their comrades. There's no way for me to press a reset button. I can't go back and change the outcome of that particular altercation. It is what it is. Thing about jujitsu is. When you tap, you're giving yourself the ability to reset and rescript. You're going to do it again and you're going to do it better this time, right? That is powerful. Like that is super, super powerful because yes, I took a hit on my confidence knowing that this didn't work, but I have a, a moment and an opportunity right then and there to change it, make it better and overcome it. Where in the military and in combat, you don't have that opportunity. It, it is what it is, right? You, you're, you're dealt with this plate. And whether or not you make it out or not, that, that's that's on you. But you can't go back and tap and reset. Right. So that element is really important. I think another one that's really important as well is the concept of sacrifice. You know, when you look at PTSD, when you take a look at and, and by the way, and I will say this as a caveat, the majority of folks that I have worked with, they don't like calling it PTSD. They call it PTS. Right. It's post-traumatic stress. It's not a disorder. Why would they say that? Well, if you take a look at it. In order to survive those sorts of austere conditions, right, just, just to be able to function, you're going to have insomnia. You're going to be hypervigilant, right? You, you're going to constantly be on this turned on mode. 
because you don't know where the next threat's coming from. You're going from firefight to firefight, right? Explosion to explosion. And Which, that kind of, not to interrupt you, but that yeah. kind of reverts back to the prompt to premises of how your body reverts to the fight or flight. When you're in war situation, you're in that heightened sense of reality for an extended period of time right. because you're, you're, you never know when a conflict, you never know if this kid walking down the street is strapped with an IED or has, has right. a gun hidden behind the corner to shoot you. You're never allowed to be calm and you yeah. do that for an extended period of time. Well, and that's the thing. It's a really important thing you mentioned there too, Kevin, because you know, for us so as human beings, we have this thing called the HPA axis, right? It's your hypothalamus, pituitary, and your adrenal glands. Well, like any system in the body, right? Like, you know, so when you work out, they always say, what's the most important part? If you want to gain muscle, what is it, right? It's your nutrition and sleep. It's not, it's not the lifting, right? It's what you do to recover afterwards. Cause if not, you keep tearing the muscle down and eventually it's, it's going to rip, right? So um, when you take a look at your own systems that are taking place from a neurological perspective, they need downtime too, right? Cause if they don't get that downtime, they can't produce the cortisol. They can't produce the epinephrine, the norepinephrine, all things that are very important to help you mitigate stress. So that's why you see so many folks coming back from deployment whose cortisol levels, they're pretty much depleted. Like they're, they're not producing any of it because their body has become so exhausted. It's so tapped out that that entire function on the HP axis is shot, right? And so can you get it back with different sorts of therapies? You can. Uh, is it easy? No, it's not. But, you know, when you take a look at specifically with, with, with PTSD, uh, and PTS, it's it's inherently important to understand that, listen, it's not just about w what is happening in that moment in time during training. It's about where the person's brain is. W where are you in this moment in time? Because if you're not here in this moment with me right here, right now, you're going to get tapped, right? So when you're thinking about this, having a flashback, this happened here, this happened there, which does happen. I've got accounts in, in my research of guys who they would be rolling. They would be in such a heightened state of stress that they had brings flashback yeah. to uh, you know, a skirmish that they were a part of. I've seen, but, but not to interrupt you again, but I've seen that happen firsthand with, with, with soldiers that are, you know, medical discharges yeah. that are dealing with PTSD that have trained with us. I've actually seen it happen where a guy flipped oh, out and yeah. had to run out of the room. We had somebody that was really, really ill for a while that was training with us that we were trying to assimilate him back in and he had to quit because of that. But yeah. And yeah. that's a very real thing, man. I mean, so, you know, when you take a look at instances like that and then you take a look at, you know, so, if this person has the ability to rescript and rewrite how this particular situation plays out, what's the first step? You got to be here. You got to be present, right? So what does it take for you to be present? Well, what's keeping you from being present right now? So all the other stuff that's out there, right? The, the, the easiest way to go about it is what? Physical harm, right? What, what, what is the thing that's going to be the most apparent? Because for most folks, we're not going to recognize that that's harming me psychologically or mentally or spiritually, right? The physical side of it, I feel there's an immediate reaction. There's a response. So if I'm rolling and I know if I'm not tuned in, I'm going to get tapped. Well, it, it starts to force you to be in the moment, to be here, to be present, which is very hard, man. When you're in an eight to five Monday through Friday in a cubicle, right? You have the ability to think all over the place, right? You're not forced because there's not an imminent threat. Jiu-Jitsu provides an imminent threat that's still safe. And, you know, there's something to be said about returning, like being able to stay present and also returning to that warrior ethos that they've cultivated for so long that has become such a part of their, their, their being, you know, like there's healing in familiarity, there's healing in that ability to say, hey, you know what? Even though I may have have some issues with the with the PTSD, the PTS that have they're causing me harm, like I can return back to that warrior persona, even if it's only for an hour a night when I'm training jujitsu, to find my healing and 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 live through that and recreate and, and stay centered and focused. No, and you're right about that, man. I mean, you know, when you take a look at what it takes for folks who have gone through a, a, a highly traumatized ordeal, you know, when people are, are, are in a situation or they're in a circumstance where they feel like every essence of who it is that they have conjured together to be exactly who they are at this moment in time, when you tell me you're no longer that person, that's in your past. And it was something that I had incredibly strong ties to. And it, it, it exposed me to a way of life and, and a way of looking at the world that I had never been exposed to before. And now you're going to tell me I'm no longer a warrior. Now I'm just a civilian and go enter the workforce and do all that. That's incredibly damaging because look, 
we're human beings. We're not human computers. I can't just churn stuff off, right? Um, so, so you have to build upon it, right? It's got to be, uh, you know, the type, type of thing where it's a scaffolding in your identity. And that's a big, big part of my research is understanding the different components of the warrior identity and the warrior ethos. And just like anything else in life, you, you want to build, you want to continue nurturing and cultivating it because you want it to adapt and change over time. And that's the whole point. People, unfortunately, and, and I will tell you, man, there's even elements of Western psychology that will push this idea of compartmentalizing, right? Now, that's who you were at this moment in time. That's not who you are anymore. Focus on what's new. You got to be real careful with that uh, because you're telling someone right, to, to kind of turn their back on, on an identity that they embraced, an identity that gave them value and worth because they were needed by their comrades to the left and to the right. Are they needed the same way in corporate America? Probably not. But the idea is, is that identity is part of who they are. And when right. you, when you, and when you add the D at the end of it, the distorter, yeah. and that's the, one of the reasons why we talked about why veterans or, 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 or people suffering from PTSD are, are very leery about going to psychological research is because Absolutely. it's teaching you to say what you were was wrong. All the great things that you got into war to do, you got in to put yourself in conflict. You believed in yourself to make the world a better place or whatever your your thought process were. You're a hero. You did the right thing. But now we're telling you, no, that's not who you are anymore. Forget about that. Put that aside. And like sh shit like that just doesn't go away. No. You know, when you when you do come to do jujitsu, you're allowed to be that warrior and continue to remember the part of you that made you who you were, right. even though you're not out living in a warlike scenario anymore. You can have it for a little bit of a time. Well, you know, and it's interesting too, man. I mean, you know, there's the, the the material culture aspect of it as well, and a lot of people don't pay enough attention to this. I mean, look, you know, when you take a look at folks who are in the military and they get dressed out. It, it means something to them to be right in, in their in their blues or to be in their formal wear where they've got all their their badges and pins and all this kind of and their 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 combat ribbons, just like putting a gi on. When I put a gi on, I put my belt on. That means something, right? It puts me in a different frame of mind, right? And, and that's incredibly powerful, right? It's the difference of you know you, you've been at home for two or three weeks, didn't shave, no haircut, you haven't gotten dressed up, and then you go you get a fresh cut, fresh shave. And you put on a brand new suit, right? You feel different, right? It, it, it's it's a different type of persona that you're stepping into, a different version of yourself. It's no different with training. Is there a certain aspect of the human psychology that needs that affirmation of of I don't know what the, the way you put it much better that affirmation of acceptance that affirmation of of warrior or or acceptance or, or hierarchy yeah. that, that needs that to survive. Yeah, it, so absolutely, right? So, yeah, so I, I asked that question you, shitty, but you get the general idea. No, Help me yeah, out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we legitimately we are wired to be social for one reason to survive. That's it, right? I mean, right. legitimately, if you look at human beings compared to elephants, rhinos, bears, but other animals in the animal kingdom, right? That are much tougher than we are, much more equipped and designed to deal with harsh elements. We are frail creatures, right? The thing that allows us to get to the apex of the food chain is this thing right here, right? And working together, symbiotically creating relationships where we can force multiply what our capacities are. So, so knowing that and knowing that we are social creatures and we have to be for survival, when you don't have that, that again, going back to social capital, if I don't have those bank of relationships to pull from, it really starts to degrade how it is I identify my place in the world and where I belong. Because truth be told, I don't know where I belong. And that that sucks. Like that that's scary stuff right there, man. That that's when you start dealing with some seriously challenging things. Um, because when you don't have that sense of belonging, even though you're not, we live in an urban wilderness, right? But we, we still feel like we're siloed and we're isolated, and yet there's people all around me, but yet I still feel incredibly lonely. Yeah, man. Um, well, anyway, dude. Like, I, I think we're, I think we're getting, I think we're getting to the end here. Um, yeah. I, I would really want to to end this thing off by talking about uh, how, in specific, that jujitsu helps soldiers because you know there's some organizations like the We Defy organization. We've had them on a great organization that helps to assimilate. Oh soldiers suffering from PTSD into jiu-jitsu to help them to cure um, 
some of the problems and and, and use the beauty of jujitsu to do that. Um, is there anything in general that you can say that the folks at home, anyone listening to this can do to help that or do to start to think of ways to build that anything in general that you think that should be done that we can draw attention to, to help yeah. that road? You know, the big, big, a big thing, right? Especially when you take a look at the army and the Marine Corps. So the Marine Corps has the, the MCMAP, which is the Marine Corps martial arts program. Army has the army combatives program. Both have gone through a huge overhaul in the past 20 years and have been incredibly I mean, heavily influenced by Gracie Jiu Jitsu, right? Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So going back to that familiarity piece, right? And building off of the, the warrior identity and the warrior ethos. When you deal with folks who have been in infantry, when you deal with folks who have been in special operations, they have been exposed to elements of Jiu Jitsu. There's no two ways about it. They just haven't been fully entrenched in the art that is Jiu Jitsu, right? It's, a, it's a, the difference between a systematic approach to using this technique this way as compared to living the jiu-jitsu lifestyle, right? Two very different things. So, so for folks at home, you know, when, when you're thinking about the context and if you're pondering, should I start jiu-jitsu or not? I know I've had some challenges with PTS, whatever, or, or traumas in general, it doesn't have to be combat related. Really think about when was the last time you had an honest conversation with yourself to where you could grasp what your true capacities and abilities are. Are. And that sounds super easy, but when you do it for real, it's hard, man. Like it, it's really, really hard, right? And so, you know, when you think about what you are doing every single day to cultivate and reinforce your truth as a person, you first have to recognize what it is. And jujitsu is an incredible thing to do that. For the military members, if you've already been exposed to elements of it, right, it's not going to be completely foreign territory for you, right? You, you're going to be able to continuously build on that warrior identity, on that military identity, while also getting some incredible therapeutic and physiological effects uh, along with it. Awesome, man. Well, Gino, man, you're freaking awesome, dude. Like that was such a like I, I just have such a good time talking to you, bro. You really, you're really just hour, man. <laughs> yeah, I know, man. I, I, I tell you, brother, we got through this thing together. Like yeah. I, I, it's I'm I'm constantly amazed. And again, you're such a, an intelligent person, and and it's the ability to people like I look at myself in my knowledge of jujitsu and MMA. Like I can fire off at will conversations with people asking me questions just about anything and figure out a way to get to answering that question even when they ask you a stupid question like some of the questions i had so i were but your ability to do that on a psychological level on your area of expertise is man it's really impressive like you really are an intelligent guy like just talking to you and, and not only are you intelligent you have a way of making things understandable for the layman like big dumb jocks like myself so like i appreciate you for coming on and i appreciate your time man anything you want to punch anything you want to talk about before we leave or anything man no man you know i'll just say you know keep, keep doing great stuff man i'm so impressed with all your work man and everything you're doing i'm a big fan so so by all means man as much like i told you before as much as you you know learn from me i, I learned from you and i greatly appreciate the discussion and, and for folks who are tuning in you know, if you're even contemplating uh, on starting to train or if you're already training and you're thinking about giving up, stick with it, right? Because it, it is a process. It is a marathon and not a sprint. And, and what you get on the backside of it, and this is from a scientific perspective, the benefits are incredible from an emotional, psychological, and a physical perspective. Well, man, I think we're going to tie it up, man. So um, my guest today was Dr. Gino Cholora. Uh, he is a PhD in neuroanthropology. Did I say your name right this time? Cholora, Cholora, fucking idiot. I'm horrible. Jesus Christ. We'll go just, with Cholora, bro. Don't worry. <laughs> I, just, I, just, I, didn't, I knew I was going to screw it up again, even when the words came out of my mouth. Good, but uh, I've been Kevin Gallagher for the Aces Jiu Jitsu blog. We're doing our interview series, podcast series, and uh, hope you guys dug this one because I sure did, man. Gino, you're awesome, brother. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you brother. so much, guys. Thanks for tuning in.